Welcome back, everyone, to my channel, The Amazing Chipmunk of Power. I don't know about amazing, but here I am. Today, I am caving to the demands of the populace. Pretty much the last video I did on movies uh, really took off. I got a lot of response out of it. Well, I love talking movies, so I need no further reason, really. Let's talk movies some more. What happens in stories a lot, generally, not just movies, especially nowadays, they tend to spawn sequels. Are the sequels always a good idea? Well, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no. A sequel is basically, it's almost always a cash grab. It really is. It's a way to make more money. However, if you have a good story and a good way to follow up on that story, then sure, why not? You can, you know, expand the story and make something good out of it. Other times, not so much. So with that extremely complicated intro, I went through a batch of popular, maybe not so popular, but a bunch of sequels to popular movies. I'm going to rank them according to how well I feel they work. Let's start with number 14. Start from the bottom and work our way up. I'm going to start with a movie I do not own. Just never liked it enough. It is number 14. It's the bottom. Never liked it enough to get it. I do have the first one. And the first one is the 1992 version of Father of the Bride. I've talked about my feelings on uh, that movie before and the original Spencer Tracy one. I do like the remake of Father of the Bride better than the original. When it comes to the sequels, I feel that the original sequel, Father's Little Dividend, is better than Father of the Bride Part 2, the newer one. This is because Father of the Bride Part 2 is fun. Basically, what happens is the bride of the original, uh, well, what comes after love and marriage, somebody with a baby carriage, so she gets pregnant. So there's the story of how her family helps her handle the pregnancy and all the uh, delightful rigmarole that comes about as a result. However, Father of the Bride Part 2, it doesn't quite work. What I remember particularly is that not only does Annie, the daughter, become pregnant, but her mother becomes pregnant. So they have to deal with two pregnancies at the same time. And of course, in movie sort of tradition, movie sort of style, they both go into labor at the same time. And in movie sort of style, it's sudden labor and they have to get to the hospital right away. You know, you can't have uh, babies in movies without that sort of drama. Also, there's shoehorning in of prior characters. There's bringing back Martin Short as Franck and B.D. Wong, um, who we, we love them. We love them. We love their characters. Uh, in the first one, they were the wedding consultants. In the second one, they have expanded their business to also deal with babies. And it just doesn't work. It's too tacked on. Like, why? Why do we have all the same characters in the same movie? Why is the mom pregnant as well? It's just too much. And it just, although still a light and fun movie, it just doesn't work overall. Ranked at number 13 is another movie that I never bothered to get, but I did watch it several times as a kid. This is the sequel to the very popular, still classic, enduring, and it makes sense that it would be the never ending story. The never ending story, I own that. It's great. Who doesn't want a luck dragon? It's still fun. It's still dark in many moments, still very scary, still heartbreaking. <laughs> and there's that underlying idea of something serious and real life. There are stakes here. The never ending story, too, is. Um, as best I recall, because now I haven't watched it recently, I should have, but like I said, I did watch it a couple times as a kid. It's way more a kid's movie. It's not so dark, it's not so serious. There are some parts that are maybe a little much for a young child, but more than that, it's just weird. There's the person with changing faces. I don't know why. There's the evil lady who 
I don't even remember what her whole deal is, although she has a very cool castle. And fashion sense, oh my goodness. There's a chicken guy. I don't know, I like the chicken guy, but you know, where are all these new characters from? Not only that, all our beloved actors from the first one being kids, they got older, so they had to recast everybody. Atreyu, the princess who is now called the childlike princess, although that wasn't her name originally, but all of a sudden it is. And, of course, Bastion is played by Jonathan Brandis. I had a thing for Jonathan Brandis for a little while, so that's why I watched this a couple times. R.I.P. Now, Jonathan Brandis, especially as a kid, he had something, and I, it's a real shame that he never got to show the world what a good actor I believe he was developing into. As a kid, he wasn't the greatest actor, and like I say, it's not a deep movie. There, there are no real particular stakes to this. Bastion is simply called back to uh, Fantasia, which somehow is more of a real place. Somehow he can go there. And he is called back to help them with an issue that they're having. But there are no particular real world stakes here that I can recall. Don't quote me. Check it out for yourself. Again, it's a fun movie. It's nothing too deep and enduring. Plus, there's no song. Okay, we're gonna get into the movies that I did buy for one reason or another. The next up is the sequel to Legally Blonde. Now, Legally Blonde is not a deep movie, right? But there is that underlying theme that makes Elle more of a real person. She's more relatable. There are some stakes for her, and we want to see her overcome the walls that are put in her way. We want her to succeed. So there's more there. Legally Blonde 2, here we are. Legally Blonde 2, Red, White, and Blonde. It doesn't do that as well. There are no particular stakes. It's basically the same movie over again, Light, L-I-T-E. <laughs> she goes to Washington, D.C. and has to prove herself all over again. However, the main stakes are simply that, her proving herself and to the Washington elites so she's working to pass legislation regarding animal rights, and that's, you know, a good cause to fight for and all that, but it's not as deep and serious a thing as regards to the plot of the movie. This is more a light and fluffy sequel. It's enjoyable, it's not necessary, but it's fun. Next up, I'm probably gonna have some people disagreeing with my order on this, no doubt. Next up, I'm putting Pirates of the Caribbean, the sequel, Dead Man's Chest. Now, Pirates of the Caribbean is not the deepest movie. It's based on a Disney World ride. How deep can it get? But it was one of those movies that I think surprised a lot of people. It's well put together. It's well paced. And there's a good plot. Dead Man's Chest ju just does not work so well. It has its good points. Naturally, there's Davy Jones. What a great character. And there's definitely some stakes there for Davy Jones. He makes a good sympathetic villain, but he can't carry the whole movie. And when it comes to our heroes, our leads, then there's not much at stake for them, not as much at stake for them. This is not lower because, mainly because of Davy Jones and the whole water wheel battle on the island that is fantastic. But other than that, there's not a lot that is memorable about this movie. Next up, a movie I used to have but actually got rid of. And this is the sequel to the 1999 Brendan Fraser, Rachel Weisz, Mummy. Now, the 1999 Mummy is one of my favorite movies. It used to be my, my absolute favorite movie, but then it kind of shares space now with everything everywhere all at once. There's no denying that one. But The Mummy, and I'm just amazed and delighted at all the love that The 99 Mummy gets online. I was not the only one who was just, who just has so much love for this movie. It's so well done, well paced, well shot, well acted, fantastic music, that soundtrack. And just the moment for me, the moment when they start the camel race, the whole part at the beginning with the sun breaking over, 
That to me is summer cinema. That is what you go to the movies for, is that moment. The Mummy 2 does not hold together as well. The pacing is off. Right at the beginning, when Patricia Velasquez enters the tent, says, I'm the reincarnation of an Oxuna Moon. He says, not yet, but you will be. Wait, 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 what? She's the what of the what? The, how did this happen? How does she look exactly like her? How, again, how did this happen? There's too much that's not explained, like even just a throwaway explanation. We're just supposed to accept this and move on, and that's the entire movie? The whole entire reincarnation thing was a bit much for me, because not only is she a reincarnation, but Evie is a reincarnation. No, no, that was a bit much, I thought. There were some things I liked. Rachel Weiss wanted Evie's character to have matured. And to me, that makes sense. Because we all love how sweet and kind of silly, but at the same time, very smart and capable Evie is in the first movie. She will have matured. She has married. She has gone off and seen the world. She will have matured and grown up a bit. And that makes sense. That works. However, the whole, all of a sudden, I'm this amazing fighter just because I'm suddenly having these memories because I was reincarnated and didn't realize it until the sequel, it, it didn't work for me. Then there are lines like, oh, we have to prevent the next apocalypse. The next apocalypse? When did we have the first one? That said, again, there are great parts like the airship. There's an airship. I love airships. You put in an airship, you got a winner for me. Even so, wasn't enough to save it. And I'm not even bringing up, okay, I am bringing up the horrible Scorpion King effect at the end. Although I don't mind that as much as the part where he loses an Oxuna Moon again in her reincarnated form, and he runs up to the pit and goes, no! It's horribly done. It's overdramatic. That said, I don't think it was the fault of the actor or even the director, more or less. I think it's an editing problem because the pacing is off on that. If you edited it differently, that moment would have worked. Still, it sticks in my head. It's a, it's a terrible moment. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm moving on. Number nine. We are back in 1999. What a year for a movie. It's kind of like 1939 in a way. We all know what a banner year 1939 was for movies. 1999 did pretty well too. In 1999, we had this little movie, you may not have heard of it, kind of slipped through the cracks, called The Matrix. We all know what a groundbreaker The Matrix was. And if you don't, then oh my gosh, where have you been hiding this whole time? The Matrix spawned two sequels. The third sequel, The Matrix Revolutions, we shall not speak of that. We will pretend it does not exist. The second one is The Matrix Reloaded. This one I find uneven. It's got a lot of great parts. It's beautifully shot. And there are undeniably fantastic scenes like the motorcycle chase on the highway. The part with the, I forget what it's called, the subway station where you just come back to the same spot. Love that. That is fantastically done. On the downside, we are spending too much time in the real world. And the real world is boring. <sighs> Plus, there are a bunch of new characters which we don't really get time to know before we are supposed to root for them. There's that whole part in Zion where they're dancing. What even is that? What is going on? Then again, on the plus side, we get that Mega Agent Smith battle on the playground. That is fantastic, if a bit cheesy in effects, and some of those don't quite work as well as they should. I believe Corridor Crew covered this as well. Also on the plus side, Harold Perrineau. Love that man. Can't go wrong. So it's kind of uneven. Half of one, half of the other. Number eight. I'm sure I will get some flack from somebody for putting this so high, but it's a personal favorite. The sequel to Gremlins. Now, a lot of us love Gremlins. Classic, right? Christmas classic. Definitely a Christmas movie. Um, I did not watch Gremlins that much, especially growing up. It would have been too scary for me. I didn't like, I didn't watch the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark for years. 
until like recently because it freaked me out too much. So gremlins, yeah, you know, gross, a little scary. It was, it was too much for me. That said, it's a fantastic movie. It really is. Gremlins 2 is silly. It is scary too, but it is more silly. It leans into that silliness. There are so many in-jokes with television. There are so many in-jokes in the movie. There are meta-jokes, and I am a sucker for a good meta-joke. This has John Glover as a mega-rich 80s-style businessman uh, who puts his name all over everything. There are definite uh, echoes of a certain other businessman um, in real life. You may pick up on that when you watch the movie, but he is fantastic. And whenever I see John Glover, this is what I think of. Is it the perfect movie? Well, no. <laughs> it's not deep. It's not, it's not pretending to be deep, but it is fun. Downsides include, unfortunately, and I hate to say this, Gede Watanabe. I love that man. He is so, he's in this, he's good at what he's doing. He's so sweet. You just want to wrap him up and take him home. Oh my gosh. He's playing a stereotype. The stereotyped Japanese tourist who is constantly with a camera. To, you know, oh, it's, it's bad. That poor man had to play so many stereotypes in his career and it's not fair and it's just not right. And it kind of hurts to watch. That said, even so, he, he does his best. He puts his all into it and you just love him as well as so many of the other characters. But overall, it's just a fun movie. It's kind of a love letter to movies as well. And I still have a very deep and abiding love for this movie. Number seven. I know I'm going to do There are going to be quite a few people disagree on. Um, there are quite a few from my childhood, the late 80s, 90s. Uh, when I was a teenager and really starting to get into movies. I didn't watch them much as a kid because we didn't have a TV and there wasn't a ton of money to throw around. You know, there never is. So I didn't get out to the movies a whole ton. It was later that I got into it. That is why when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a thing, I didn't, I wasn't into it. I didn't get into it until later when I started watching videos a lot and then I got it from the store and enjoyed it and it's a very good very enjoyable movie it's fun it's got Casey Jones you can't argue with Casey Jones now when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 came out I was living in a small town we had one theater downtown that had split into two and one theater was showing TMNT 2 the other theater was showing Mel Gibson's Hamlet my parents and I went down to see Hamlet. Now, I was about 12, I think, when these came out. And the line for the snacks for TMNT2 was out the door. We walked in. They saw a little 12-year-old me. I said, oh, we're sold out. We said, you're sold out of Hamlet? <laughs> they were not sold out of Hamlet. They were a little surprised. But yes, I was not into the Turtles at that point. I got into it later, and that's why Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 is next on the list. Again, are these deep movies? No, they're not deep movies. They are just fun. They are so much fun. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 does not have Casey Jones, unfortunately, more is the pity. It does have Kino. It has Ernie Rias Jr. I love Ernie Rias Jr. He's just got a likability. And he's very, very good at everything that he does. This also has the Vanilla Ice Club sequence with Go Ninja, Go Ninja, Go. And it has the subway where they go as their hideout. Remember that subway car? Who didn't want to live there? That's why this movie is so high on my list. Number six, here we go. <laughs> Another retro one. I have seen a lot of people complain about this movie online, and I don't understand why. Is it just fashionable to complain about it all of a sudden? I really like it. I really enjoy it. Is it the best sequel ever? Heck no. It's not the best sequel ever. The first movie was Ghostbusters. Now, who's gonna deny the awesomeness of Ghostbusters? It's got the light horror, it's got the laughs, it's got the camaraderie. 
It's got Walter Peck, who does not get the appreciation that he deserves, that hardworking man who was just trying to do his dang job. I can do a photo on that essay. Ghostbusters 2 is next up on my list. Is it great? As I said, no. No, it's not great. But it is good. It is fun. Does it shoehorn in characters? You betcha. Because why is Dana back in there being terrorized by ghosts? Why is she again being singled out? Does she have, like, the mark of the beast upon her or something? Why? But that said, she does, and if you accept that, then you can accept pretty much anything else in the movie because ghosts as a thing have been established, so you can just roll with it. There's a bit of those meta laughs because it has been five years since the original. Ghostbusters have kind of faded, just like they do in the movie, and I love the part at the beginning when they're at the birthday party. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it makes me laugh every time. This movie has a dancing toaster. It has Peter McNichol. It has, yes, it has the Statue of Liberty walking through New York City, and I think a lot of people have a problem with that, and I don't see why, because I just love it. Is it a giant marshmallow man? No, but still it's the Statue of Liberty walking through New York City. I think it's pretty cool. And it has Vigo the Scourge of Carpathia. You just, you can't deny the awesomeness of Vigo the Scourge of Carpathia. And never forget, all of this could have avoided if Vigo hadn't lost his kitten. Just painting him a little kitten, that's all you had to do. Getting down to the top five. Okay, I am going to explain this one, aren't I? So as number five, I have the sequel to Back to the Future. Back to the Future. What a great movie. The performances, the plot, the pacing, the music, the songs, it is all an indelible part of our pop culture history. Back to the Future, the musical, is in Chicago for a few weeks at the time of this filming, and I was sorely tempted, as silly as it sounds. And it doesn't have great reviews, but anyway. Back to the Future 3, also a great movie. Amazing how they pulled that off, right? <laughs> Both of those are classics of our times. Back to the Future 2, not so much. It does not hold up to the standards of either 1 or 3. It is the weakest of the three movies. That said, there is a lot on the shoulders of the second one. It has to provide that connection between the first movie and the third movie. Marty goes to the future, then he comes back to the past, then he's all over the place. He has to prepare to go to the far past. And there's a lot of information that has to go into this movie. There is a lot of stuff that happens in this movie. So it's a bit overloaded. You can definitely argue that. And the plot is complicated. <laughs> it is really hard to follow, at least the first time. There are some parts that just don't really seem to work. Like the future. I mean, obviously, it's been in 2015 has been and gone, and it wasn't, you know, where's our hoverboards? So yeah, but even at the time this was made, that was pretty silly looking. It was never meant to be taken seriously. What we did get out of this movie is one, hoverboards, and instantly lacing sneakers. We still, we want those, where are those? And we got some fantastic effects. We really did. Think about the part in the car with the old Biff and the young Biff, and the one hands the other, the almanac. It's so well done. It still holds up. You cannot see the seam, even though you can see the seam. Stuff like that just blows my mind, and it blew my kids' minds when they watched it. The stuff still holds up. Number two, you have the wallet sequence. It, it's a short sequence, it's silly, but I still love it. I still say, I think he stole his wallet. Love wallet guy. And third and most important, as I said, this movie provides the connective tissue between one and three. And there is an explanation of what is going on on in the movie. And that is complicated and difficult to wrap your head around. Time travel in the first place makes no sense because there's an inherent paradox, right? But if you accept time travel as having been a thing which you have to for the movie to work, then the explanation of how the timeline has branched and changed because of the changes that Marty made, when you sit down and really think about that explanation, and piece it out, it makes sense. 
And that is a hard thing to do. That's why this movie impresses me. Ranked at number four is the sequel to the early 90s version of The Addams Family. I love, lovey dovey, love, love, love the 90s version of The Addams Family. Had it on video, watched it over and over and over again, almost knew every line. Still love it, and the kids and I watch it every Halloween. If nothing else, the music for Mark Shaman. And I'm sorry, I can't get into the new Wednesday. And the reason why is because not only do they have, well, not only is she uh, actually homicidal, which in the other movies at least always happened off screen if it happened at all it was more a suggestion um just saying and you could always be like oh well she acts like that but she's more emo or goth and wouldn't actually do these things to have her actually doing them just that was a little much for me then you have the fact that there's actual magic and again in the movies there was more a suggestion of that like, there could still be a real-world explanation. These people live in the real world. But then when you're introducing magic and it's just another... I'm sorry. I personally am tired of the person going to magic school trope. It's It's been done. I, let's move on to something else. I know, I'm probably in the minority. Anyway. Adam's Family Values. Right here. This is one of our Thanksgiving movies. The other one? Nightmare Before Christmas. It's a Halloween movie and a Christmas movie. Therefore, you watch it at Thanksgiving. It's a Thanksgiving movie, at least in America. So Adam's Family Values, obviously a Thanksgiving movie because of the entire Thanksgiving performance at camp. Just for that alone, it's so funny, such a treat. These characters are still the same as when we saw them last, and it makes sense they would all still be in this movie. There are new characters, but they make sense that they would be there. There's Peter McNichol again. I, gu I guess he's just a treat, along with Christine Baranski and David Krumholtz. Sucker for the Krumholtz. There's a new little baby, but that doesn't feel shoehorned in, especially when you consider how much Gomez and Morticia love each other. They're still of childbearing age. That makes sense. And not in the movie too much. They don't rely on it too much as a plot device. And need we mention the amazing Joan Cusack. Coming down to the big three. Again, I'm sure there will be some disagreement. This would be the sequel to Shrek. The first movie, Shrek, so many memes, so many quotable lines. Such an unusual movie when it came out. Except maybe for those of us who had read Terry Pratchett and saw this in which there were plot lines that were very similar to this movie. Still, a great movie. At the same time, I didn't feel Shrek was as sharp as it could have been. It was a little slow for me. The pacing was a little bit off. There are some points that are just slow, slower than they could be. Shrek 2 fixes that problem. It is sharper, it is better paced, Plus which, we have the benefit of knowing the characters, as we often do in a sequel. We don't have to have so much introduction to them. And that's usually a benefit. The new characters do not feel shoehorned in, because they make it make sense. They want to go and meet her parents, therefore we have to meet the parents, and anybody who has anything closely to do with them. And I personally love the bit with Prince Charming and his mother, the fairy godmother. That's the only thing I don't really care for in the Shrek movies, um, particularly the second one, is using pop songs. Although I had never heard of the song I Need a Hero until that movie I missed out. But just that whole thing with using pop songs as started, I believe, with Moulin Rouge. And at the time, that was cute and different, and it's just been used and overused by this point. I'm really sick of it. I'm sorry. And so many Broadway musicals, Back to the Future, as I said, um, although they did write new songs for that as well. But so many Broadway musicals now are just, let's use some pop songs and make a, a plot out of it. And I just, can we get some original stuff here, please? Wicked is pretty old by now. We've got Lin-Manuel Miranda. But other than him, who's out there? Am I missing something? 
Anyway, I just, I would like some original songs. Um, that said, the pop songs they use work. The whole plot to me is more interesting than the first one. It really picks up where the plot of the first one left off and continues in a fashion that works, that makes sense from a narrative perspective. Way more than the third one did, and way, 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 way more than the fourth one did. If you haven't seen the fourth one, don't. Don't even bother. It's so boring and unfunny. But Shrek 2, Shrek 2, I really enjoyed. That works. Okay, sequel number two would be, and I, I, I'm probably not going to get as much pushback on this one, but still might. We'll see your opinion. Sequel number two. Wait, well, they're all number two. Uh, sorry. Is the sequel to Batman Begins. Batman Begins was an enjoyable enough movie. It had Killian Murphy. He's great. We tend to cast him as a villain, don't we? I saw him recently in something where he wasn't a villain, and it was such a breath of fresh air. He's such a good actor. Anyway, I also remember seeing Batman Begins when it came out in the theater, and the sound was really loud. And the screeching of the bats was so strong that my unborn child in my tummy was wiggling around kicking so much, and I was trying to cover him so that it wouldn't get at his little ears so much. I would have gotten up and gone and asked them to turn it down, but I didn't want to miss any of the movie. <laughs> anyway, that's my personal silly little story. The sequel, obviously, is The Dark Knight. And most of us know why. Everyone else in this movie does a great job. Everyone does. But this is Heath Ledger's movie. This is Heath Ledger's legacy, and there's a reason for it. His performance was off the charts. It was out of this world. It was absolutely amazing. He inhabited that character like no one. It was so deep. It was so strong. I really just don't think I can add anything there. If you haven't seen The Dark Knight, go see it. At least if you're not like a, a little kid, then it will scare the pants off you. Please don't see it if you're a little kid, but if you're older, definitely watch it if you haven't. Sequel number one on the list. What kind of movie fan would I be if I didn't pick The Empire Strikes Back? This is it. This is the big one. This is the sequel the bridge between the first and the third, both great movies in their own right, don't come at those Ewoks. I love the Ewoks. But the second one, for many of us, is the best of the three. And the, there's a reason for it. It does its job and it does it so well. Star Wars had stakes, right? Undeniable stakes. You want to stop the Empire from blowing up the planets. That's not cool. Stop blowing up planets. They're bad guys. You want to kick their butts. In Empire, the stakes are also personal, and they become even more personal. There's Han sacrificing himself. That deepens his character. And of course, there's Luke's entire quest to become less whiny and more grown up. I don't have a problem with Luke in the first one. Everybody says, oh, he's whiny. Of course he's whiny. He's a teenager who's been stuck on this crappy little planet. He wants to get out. He wants to see the world. Teenagers tend to be whiny. It's a thing. He's not mature. He needs to mature over the progress of the story. And he even does that by the end of Star Wars. However, he does it even more in the next two movies and especially in Empire. He could not be the man he is in Jedi without having gone through the events of Empire. And there's so many great things in this movie. There's Hoth. There's the battle on Hoth with the walkers. There's Yoda. I'm not going to deny Yoda. There's the Emperor, Captain Creepo Pants. I don't know if he wears pants. I'm not going to go there. There's Lando. We love Lando. He is arguably even more of a rogue than Han is and does turn them in and all that, but then he turns good, so... Everybody's got something going on. Even Leia at the end realizes something that she didn't before or has the beginnings of it. There's the music. There's the whole reveal with Darth Vader. It's, you can't beat that reveal. It's become such a cliche, but for those of us who were not old enough to see it in the theater, 
I was one year old when this came out, I think. Can you imagine? Can you imagine seeing that for the first time and going, what? What an experience would that be? Incidentally, if you guys are going to buy the Star Wars movies, buy these copies if you can. I don't think they're, they're out anymore. You have to look online. But these particular copies, and the reason why is because Lucas, you know, he did the special editions and put in all the extra scenes and extra effects, and now you can't buy the original movies. They're just with the extra effects, and the extra effects are neat. The extra scenes are neat, but they're not the originals. They're frankly unnecessary. It's great to have them as an extra, but not as part of the original movie and as that as your only option. If you buy these editions, these are the special ones with the effects, but they come with a second disc full of extras, and on that second disc is the original movie. So that is the version I put on. My kids have never seen the versions with the effects. So those are my rankings for all those sequels. Put your arguments in the comments. I'm sure <laughs> there are disagreements and opinions to be had. That's Fantastic. I want to hear them all. What sequels did I not list that you think are really great, are worth checking out? What do you look for in a sequel? Do you like something that's just kind of a tack on, sure, let's just have some fun with this, or do you like something that deepens the original story? So let's get some conversation and discussion going. Oh, this is so exciting. I will see you next week, and you have a great week until then, and Oh boy, I can't even talk. Can't make words. So I will be done now. Bye.